All right. We've discussed um, electronegativity, the general concept of ionic bonding, covalent bonding. Let's talk about bond polarity and dipole moments. Um, in order to talk about those, because those are the next natural extension of uh, when we're going to be describing things in a covalent bond, we need to know what their definitions are. So a dipole moment is going to be uh, this unequal distribution of electrons caused by a difference in electronegativity. Um, it's a vector quantity, and that's a, a physics term. So it, uh, by, a vec- by saying it's a vector quantity, it has both a direction and a magnitude. Um, and if you're a fan of the show Community, pop, pop. Um, if you're not a fan of the show Community, shame on you, I think. I don't know. It's very divisive. A vector quantity is going to has, be drawn as an arrow. So the arrow is going to point the direction of the quantity, and the bigger the arrow is, is going to tell you how strong uh, the dipole moment is. When we make a molecule, we're going to add up all of the dipole moments in a molecule. Um, and I'm, we're going to walk through a simulation to describe that. If we have no overall dipole moment, um, we're defin- we definitely have a nonpolar molecule. If we end up having a very, very, very small dipole moment, we'll sometimes go ahead and say that we have a nonpolar molecule. Um, even though technically it's not, it just behaves like it's nonpolar. If we have a dipole moment, it's polar. So here's our simulation. Um, okay, okay. So this simulation is on that FET website uh, that we've used before. The nice thing about this uh, FET simulation um, is it gives us a whole bunch of different things that we can play with. So I'm going to just turn everything off here for a second and then uh, have us walk through it. So uh, here at the very bottom, we have... Yeah, you can kind of read it. Okay, it's supposed to be yellow. And if you follow the link um, and you play with this at home, um, it will be yellow. What it has is it says uh, atom A, so the gray atom right here. And it's going to have um, the electronegativity on a sliding scale. So we can make the atom more electronegative or less electronegative. And the black box has the same thing but for atom B here, uh, the black atom. That's a nice comic book reference. All right. So over here on our view, we have dipole moment. Um, and a dipole moment is going to get this uh, very specific looking arrow drawn on it. Um, the arrow is like your typical two-headed arrow. But on the other side that doesn't have an arrow, we're going to put a little line through it. So it's almost going to look like a plus sign. In fact, I do think of it as a plus sign on this end of the arrow. The dipole moment is going to point towards the atom that is more electronegative. Uh, Partial charges are another way that we're going to write this out. And then we're going to have bond character as a thing that we can show. So the bond character has this uh, is now shown up on the screen. On the left, we're saying it's more covalent in character uh, for this bond between the gray atom and the black atom. That's so good. Um, on the far right, we have more ionic. Okay, let's start playing with some stuff. Let's change the electronegativity of atom A, and let's just for the uh, an extreme. Let's go all the way and let's say that atom A is highly electronegative electronegative compared to atom B. First off, down here in our bond character, we have shifted to be way more ionic in character. The bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more like an ionic um, bond you'll be. There is so much stuff going on in my house right now. I don't not understand it. Let's turn on the bond dipole. 
All right. So can you see that arrow that popped up? Yes. All right. Groovy. This arrow has kind of this positive bad positive sign over here next to atom B, the black atom, and it's pointing towards atom A. It's pointing towards atom A because atom A is more electronegative. Let's take the electronegativity of atom A and let's back it off. So as we are becoming less electronegative, not only are we changing our bond character to be more covalent in nature, we're also making that arrow smaller. Because remember, it's a vector quantity, so it's got a direction and a magnitude. The smaller the arrow, the smaller the uh, amount of difference. So as we go to less ele electronegative, arrow is getting smaller and smaller, but it does not change its direction. It continues to go towards atom A until we have no difference on electronegativity. We have a very nonpolar covalent bond, and we've got our arrows there. Let's turn on partial charges. And let's do atom B as our slider this time. So now the arrow, we should see it starting to grow in. It's going to be pointing towards atom B because we're saying atom B is more electronegative. But we're also seeing these little things that are growing on the uh, sides of atom A and atom B. The symbol that is now drawn here is the lowercase Greek delta. So we use this lowercase uh, delta to mean partial change. So big, big, the triangle, big delta, is like a formal change. And then the lowercase delta is a partial change. We put this partial positive next to the more electro positive or less electro negative atom. In this case, it's going to be A. With B, because it's more electro negative, we put the partial negative sign next to B. So, this terminology of partial charges is something that you're definitely going to need to know. And you're going to be able to, you're going to want to be able to denote that in your writing. So, not only do you need to be able to draw your dipole arrows, you need to, um, or your bond dipole arrows, you're going to also need to be able to write out those partial charges. What happens if we change atom A's electronegativity to be more like atom B's? Everything disappears. We have a pretty covalent bond. Both atom A and atom B are highly electronegative, but since their electronegativities are the same, it doesn't matter. The difference between electronegativities is what counts. Does that make question. sense? Yes, question. So that scale, can, can a bond be more, can it be like kind of covalent, kind of ionic? Or is like it this? either covalent or ionic? Yeah, so this is, so we're like right here by saying that our atom A is kind of electronegative, kind of isn't, um, compared to atom B. Like we've landed now where our barn character is halfway between covalent and ionic. Okay, so think about this sliding scale here as the difference between black and white. Everything in the middle would be shades of gray. And if you have, you yeah, you can have a gray that is 50% black, 50% white. But then would you say, is that gray black or white? Well, it's gray. Um, it's kind of hard to denote specifically, is it more black or is it more white? If it was off to one side or the other, you could say, oh, that gray has more black character to it. That's not a super beautiful answer in that it gives you an absolute, but that's because there's not a good absolute for this. Okay, dope. So that's not a great, beautiful answer that's going to give you a hard and fast rule on whether something's ionic or something's covalent. You can kind of have it be both. Okay. At, at the end of the day, the important thing, the truly important thing is 
I want you to say, yeah, there's a bond there and it's going to have more ionic character or it's going to have more covalent character. Okay. And that quick, dirty rule of thumb totally applies. Which side of the periodic table are the two things from? They're both from the non-metals. It's going to be more covalent. Both from, or one from the metal, one from a non-metal. It's going to be more ionic. That dirty, quick, dirty rule of thumb, 99% of the time is going to work for you, especially in general chemistry. So, oh, look, I think the colors are actually showing up nicely for that one. Or for this one, I'm going to go all the way to the left so that everybody has the same uh, electronegativity between atom A and atom B. So what we've got around our atoms now is an uh, electrostatic potential map or surface. And what this is going to give us is an idea as to which side of our molecule is more positive and which side of our molecule is more negative in terms of uh, in terms of electrostatic potential. So kind of to some degree gives us an indication of um, where the electrons are spending more of their time. If we turn A to be really electronegative, the gray atom on the left, um, we see the partial negative we see the partial positive, we see the dipole moment, and we see this electrostatic potential map. So why are we talking about this electrostatic potential map? Because realistically, um, the electrostatic potential and the electron density, which we're going to talk about in a second, are helpful when we are trying to predict chemical reactivities they're just a pain in the butt to draw. Like if you're going to come to a test and have to draw out the electrostatic potential map for a molecule, you're going to have to bring your colored crayons with you. And, you know, that's kind of a bummer. Um, it's way easier for us to ask you to draw out the partial charges. But what we want you to recognize with the partial charges being there um, is those, they give us an idea of what this, electrostatic potential around the molecule actually looks like. Same thing for electron density. Um, so here with electron density, uh, it's the grayer it is, it means the electron is spending more time in this region of space than it is around the lighter uh, gray areas. And with the just like with the electrostatic potential, uh, our electron density map lines up exactly along with what we've written out in terms of our bond dipole and writing out our partial charge partial charges how do we measure any of this stuff though i mean right because it's all theoretical at this point well turns out that these molecules will orient themselves in a magnetic field such that the positive Let's go to the electrostatic potential map here. This blue, uh, the positive end of a molecule, will try to orient itself next to, in a, in a magnetic field, towards the negative side of the magnetic field, and the negative side of the molecule will try to orient itself towards the positive side of a magnetic field. So we can actually get molecules to line up in specific directions by applying, if, if they are polar or they have ionic like character um, and we put them in a magnetic field. Why is this important? Well, um, not only can we get molecules to do this, we can also, so by getting molecules to do this, uh, it can help us do some kind, some imaging techniques um, for different kinds of diagnostics. Uh, electrons also have this same kind of behavior. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, so magnetic fields are a thing. We've talked about bond dipoles, shown how to uh, how the arrow works and how that's drawn. We've done partial charges, and we draw that little squiggly uh, partial charge, that lowercase delta. We've talked about bond character. We've talked about electron density, potential, electrostatic potential, and how electronegativity dictates all this. Let's do a more one more complicated example and see how 
this stuff still applies, but for even more complicated stuff. So there's very few diatomic species in the world. They're very important, sure, but there's very few. Most of the time, the molecules that we're going to work with in general chemistry are going to be made up of uh, three or more atoms. So something like you might see here, we've got our A, we've got our uh, B, the black ball here, and the C, this pink ball. Down at the bottom, we have our sliders for the electronegativity for each atom. Up in the right, we have the individual bond dipoles. We also have this thing now that's going to be called a molecular dipole. A molecular, and we're going to also have partial charges. So the only new thing on this part of the simulation is this molecular dipole. Let's see how this works. Let's change the electronegativity of atom A to be way bigger than atom B or atom C. So if we do that, I'm going to turn the dipole, the molecular dipole moment off here for a second. We end up with something like we saw on the previous uh, two atom simulation. A, partial negative, B, partial positive dipole moment. And we draw out our arrow. But because there's no difference in electronegativity between B and C, we don't have any kind of arrow. We can make a difference between B and C. If we crank up the dipole moment for C to be just as big as it is for A, now we have a dipole moment for our bond between A and B. We also have a separate dipole moment for C and B. So A gets a partial negative, C gets a partial negative, the partial positive for B gets even bigger. The reason it gets even bigger is now the electrons from B are getting pulled towards A and they're getting pulled towards C because that electronegativity is the ability for an atom to draw electrons towards it. So B is really just getting like hammered from both A and C, losing electron density. So we've got a bond arrow here. We have a bond arrow here. But our molecule now has three atoms. This is where the molecular dipole arrow comes into play. The molecular dipole arrow is going to be the addition of every single individual bond dipole added together. So this one was oriented this way, and it was really big. This one was oriented the other way, and it was really big. If we add them both together with vector math, we get this yellow arrow like this. This yellow arrow is going to give us an indication of our electrostatic potential map for this more complicated system. So where the yellow arrow is pointing is where we would expect to find the most uh, electronegative portion of the molecule. It's also where we would expect to find the most electron density. Where the positive side of that arrow is, here around atom B, is where we would expect to find the least amount of electron density. To help try to illustrate this uh, adding the two black arrows together thing, we're going to change the electronegativity of atom C. We're going to decrease it all the way such that atom C and B have the same electronegativity. So note as we drop that electronegativity of C, the bond dipole for C starts getting smaller and smaller. Notice what's happening to the molecular dipole moment. It's getting smaller and it's starting to point more towards A. This is because A is still highly, highly electronegative. And now when we add this black arrow plus this other black arrow together, this is the overall vector that we get. So we keep decreasing it. We keep decreasing it. B and C's difference in electronegativity is dropping. The bond dipole is getting smaller and smaller. A and B is staying absolutely the same. 
if we go to a point where B and C have the exact same electronegativity, note our molecular dipole moment and our bond dipole moment are now the exact same size and they're oriented in the exact same direction. This is telling us that over here around atom A, this gray atom, this is where we have the most electron density for this overall molecule. If we go crazy and we say A and B, A and C have the same electronegativity, so the gray and the pink have the same electronegativity, but B becomes way electronegative, like in the case of water. Well, A and B have a dipole moment, the bond dipole that points towards B. C and B have a bond dipole moment that points towards B. When we add this arrow and this arrow together, it becomes this yellow arrow that's pointing up this way. The only way to feel more comfortable with these things is a little bit more pr is is practice. Um, and if you go to the uh, website that I had linked, they actually have real molecules that you can play with. You just have to download the Java application um, in order to play with those real molecules. And that's kind of fun because it gives you the same kind of indications that you can look at. So that was a lot, but that's the essence of uh, bond polarity, dipole moments, and electronegativity. So what's the number one key thing that you got to know in order to get any of this right? Like to be able to draw something like what you've what I've got on the screen over there, what do you have to... Um, what's the one thing you absolutely have to know in order to get any of that right? How much electronegativity there is? That's right. You gotta have that electronegativity down. Yep. Absolutely. Without that electron, without understanding what electronegativity is, all of the covalent bonding stuff is meaningless. Yep. The reason that this stuff is going to be so important is, um, I'm pulling up a table right now. Um, we are going to be starting to draw Lewis structures for molecules on, I guess, Friday. Um, by in order to predict the shapes of molecules and then be able to predict whether a molecule is a polar molecule or not, you have to know the electronegativity stuff and you have to know this bond dipole stuff. So we're going to use Lewis structures plus this information that we just went over to finally decide whether molecules are polar or nonpolar.